been a while since I've been here. Thank you. Keep your Bibles open. Can you turn me down a little bit? Keep your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 3. This is one of the smaller books that's in the New Testament, one of the smaller letters. But in this letter, if you have time this afternoon and you want to do some Bible reading, read 1 John. Uh, it would be great to read the whole thing, but if you want to start somewhere, start with chapter 3. Because in here, John tells you who and what you are. He tells you how God looks at you and the relationship that you're able to have with the great God of heaven. This relationship isn't based on performance. It isn't based on what you do or don't do. It is a relationship based on love. And it is a love that draws you into family. Amen. Now, on this earth, you've either had a good experience with your family or a bad experience. And sometimes you can have both. Okay? In this life, we all have been tainted with the defects of sin. Amen. And it's effects on how we treat other people. So sometimes when you talk about family, that may not be a good um, feeling or thought or remembrance for some people. Other people, you have really good fond memories of your family, what it was like growing up. But what I want you to think about this morning is what it's actually like to be part of God's family. Because there's two phases to this. There is the first phase that starts here on this earth. And the Bible tells you that when God brings you into his family, he treats you as a family member. There's a second phase, and that is what the family is going to be like when Jesus comes and we all are gathered together back in heaven and then here on this earth for all eternity. Amen. Okay? Now, the Bible tells you that in this life, God treats you as a son and as a daughter. The Bible makes it plain that if you're a child of God, God will, he uses in the uh, King James Version, the word chastise. You know what that word means? It's not a fun word. It's not a nice word. Yes, it means spank. Now, many of us remember what it was like to be spanked when we were kids and we did something wrong. I can tell you from experience that I deserved a lot of spankings. And I probably didn't get as many as what I actually deserved. But why does God have to discipline us? Why does he have to chastise us? Because the Bible makes it plain that whoever he loves, he chastises. And that if he didn't chastise you, then you wouldn't be a son, but you would be an illegitimate child. But we're not illegitimate children. We are children of the Most High God. I want you to think about this because it seems like a contradiction. A loving God who chastises His children because He loves them. But I want you to think about your own human nature. Even the best of us are still sinful. Is that right? Amen. Amen. So even the best of us, when compared to Jesus Christ, who is the epitome of perfection, is mm -hmm. that right? He was the only man that ever walked this earth that was perfect. Mm -hmm. He did not sin. Now, when you compare yourself to him, do you come up equal with him? <laughs> Negative. Do you come up higher than him? No. Never. Okay? Now, this is what I want you to understand this morning, because this is what you need to understand about God and how much He loves you. And that is the fact that when you compare yourself to Christ, where does that comparison lead you? Jesus is up here, and the bar is set really high. Where do we come in? I know that when I look at my life and I look at Christ's life, I'm not even down here. I'm so far down, I'd be in China. <laughs> But do you realize that when God looks at you and compares you to His Son in Christ, you are right there with Him? Amen. Equal, 
not lower, equal. You are a son and a daughter of God. Now here's a question for you. When Christ came and he took on human nature, did he have to bear the chastisement of his father as well? Yes. That was good, yes. That was right out there. That was not even thought, yes. And the answer is, yes. Why? He had to learn how to submit. Amen. Why? Because he was human. Are we not human? Amen. Do we not have to learn to submit? Let me ask you, is submitting easy? No. No, that all depends on what it is I need to submit to. If I know that the reward is worth the submitting, submitting is easy. We do it every day when we go to work. Isn't that right? Amen. We do it every day when we get pulled over by a policeman. Well, Amen. Maybe not. <laughs> but I want you to think about this. Every day when you're at work and you got a boss, if you like your boss, it's one thing. But if you don't like your boss and you don't like your job, you still have to submit to that authority, right? Mm -hmm. Why do you do it? You do it because that's what gives you the paycheck at the end of the week. So you understand that reward and punishment are a part of that. But I want you to realize that with God, that doesn't even enter into his equation. God doesn't treat us through a reward or punishment system. He doesn't chastise us because we've done something wrong. He chastises us to bring us into a right relationship. Amen. Now that is hard to grasp that concept. It's hard to understand, and especially hard to understand when you're dealing with that aspect of the life. Okay, but I want you to think about this. I used to tell my son when he was about five or six, don't stick your toys in the electrical socket because you're not going to like the outcome. Well, he never actually stuck it in far enough to feel what that outcome was. So by me telling him, it didn't do anything for him. Okay? Until that one magical day when he got a toy that was just the right size and was just the right length and he stuck it in that plug. Wow. Okay? And then the light came on. Okay? The light came on, he realized why I kept telling him, do not stick those things inside that light socket because you're not going to like it. And after that experience, you know what? He never stuck anything else in the light socket. Now, each one of us learn differently. And God works with us in different ways. But there are times when God has to allow us to experience those things we want to do when for our good we shouldn't do them. Did you ever have that in your life? Oh, like when you were a teenager? And maybe in your early 20s? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah, experience is the best teacher. Think about this. Ultimately, you don't want your children doing those things that you may have experienced and you knew the consequences of. So you tell them, don't do that, right? Now, God gave us his word, and in that word is contained those things that he doesn't want us to do and those things he wants us to do. Is that right? Amen. Now, how many of you actually followed God's word perfectly your entire life? Raise your hand. Now, this man's shaking his head, so he's got a lot of experience of, of what it's like not to follow God's word. Me too. Oh, I follow the word. I bounce around. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Amen. Me too. Amen. One of the things that I knew was wrong was treating people badly. Okay? I knew that from a child. I knew that God didn't like it, that my mother wouldn't like it, and I didn't like it when it was done uh, to me. But I realized that you could get what you wanted if you manipulated people and sometimes even hurt them. And at that point, I realized that I'd rather have what I wanted than what was best for them. And ultimately, what was best for me. But God showed me through experience how bad that type of thinking is. 
And the things with those types of experiences is that even though God forgives you, there is a price to be paid. Is that right? Amen. And God forgives you, but He doesn't take away the consequences. Right? And those consequences continue to follow us all the days of this life. Now, even though there's consequences, are you forgiven? Yes. In God's point of view, has He forgotten that sin? Yes. Yes. He said, the Bible says that He separates you from your sin as far as the east is from the west and as deep as the deepest depth of the ocean. That's pretty far, right? Amen. In Christ, your sins are remembered no more. Do you understand that? This is why as Christians, you do not have to fear the judgment. Because the judgment isn't about you anyway. Amen. Right? So as Christians, you do not have to fear the judgment. You don't have to fear this time of trouble that's talked about. All you have to do is trust that your God is able to save you and get you through these things. But why do we still have consequences that follow us all the days of our lives? We're a rebellious lot. Because fun until you get caught. <laughs> the rewards are great. Therefore, I'm going to suck up the rewards and God finally get caught. And I won't do that anymore, maybe. There is a law that for every action, there is what? Reaction. Reaction. Is that a law or is that just something that your teacher decided? Well, that sounds good. I'll teach it to you. It's an actual law and it doesn't change. So whatever action that you cause, there is a reaction. However you treat people, there is going to be a reaction of that that is going to continue to follow. Let's look at families and generational sin. Are you familiar with that? Generational sin. Uh, in my family, it would be alcoholism and adultery. Okay? Generational sins. Sins that are passed from the fathers to the sons, from the mothers to the daughters. Okay? Now... Have any of you came out of an alcoholic family? Do you know what that is like? And even if you have that person that's the alcoholic change his life, give his heart to God, there is still scars that will last and that continue to go with those people that you've affected to your children, and even though you may not be an alcoholic no more, do your children still have to worry about being susceptible to being alcoholics? Yes, right? So for every action, there is a reaction. For everything that we do, there is a reaction that's going to come from that. The Bible calls that the law of reaping. The Bible says what? You will reap what? what you sow. If you sow good seed, you'll reap good seed. If you sow bad seed, you'll reap bad seed. If you do both, you'll reap both. But you got to nurture along the way. What God has called us into in this relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ, the fact that what we read here in 1 John, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, or has given unto us that we should be called what? Children, sons, daughters of God. I want you to think about that. Would you like to be the son of the royal family in England? Yeah, me neither. Especially with the press they have this week. Right? Would you like to have would you like to have a child <laughs> representing your royal family like that? Okay, so I want you to have that thought in your head because we represent Christ. We represent the royal family. What is your representation that the world sees when you live your life every day? Okay, is it a good representation? Are they going to see Jesus for who he is? Or do they see a fake, false, mean-spirited Jesus? So listen, you've been called children of God with all of the benefits that go along with them. But with the benefits also come the responsibility. 
Now, do you think Prince William, isn't that the first child? Wasn't there two? As I said, the heir and despair. Would you like to be despair? Okay, Prince William, do you think he has a little more responsibility than Harry? Yes. Okay, which is why you don't see his pictures going around. And I'm sure they're glad he's married now. You know what I mean? But as children of God, sons and daughters, we get to know what heaven is like right now. It's not a future thing for us. It is something that takes place now. That Jesus said when he was on this earth, the kingdom of heaven is here, is now. When we give our hearts to him, we give our lives to him, we become part of that kingdom. Heaven is here now. This is how you can have joy in the midst of all the suffering that goes on on this planet. I ask this in my Sabbath school class. If you were to look at the entire world and all the people in it, would the majority of people be living in happiness or sorrow? Sorrow. 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 Without, without even thinking about that, doesn't take a lot of thought. The majority of people on this planet live in sorrow. But yet, as children of God, we can live in the midst of that sorrow and still have joy and peace and happiness. Why is that? Because the kingdom of heaven is here and is now. How do we go from allowing our circumstances to control us to allowing us to control our circumstances? How does that happen? Boy, you guys got quiet. I was hoping somebody gave me an answer. Because of the instant reward. Physical. We are able to not be overcome by our circumstances, by who lives in us. Is that right? Amen. Who lives in you? Right. Do you go through this life day by day in your own power? No. no. In your own strength? No. Is it your own cunning and your own power that's going to make you survive or break you? This is what I don't get about those that reject the gospel message. The Bible tells you in John 3.16, we all know that, right? What does John 3.16 say? Repeat, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but what? But have everlasting life. The world. Everybody. Everybody can be saved. The saddest thing is not everybody will be saved. And that's because of the choices that they make. Amen. Salvation is open to everybody. Now those of you that are gathered here have chosen to accept God's free gift in His Son. Amen. And in accepting that gift, God has now adopted you, brought you into His family, and you are children of God. Do you realize that wherever Prince William and Prince Henry go, people know who they are, right? If they recognize a face, they don't have to say anything. They realize that's the royal family. Do you realize that you are more royal than they are? That your bloodline is perfect. And you can check their bloodline, not so perfect, okay? You can trace your bloodline right to Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Is there a better pedigree? No. no. I want you to understand this morning, and if you remember one thing when you leave here, and you go through this week, I want you to remember who you are in Christ, that you are royalty. The Bible tells you that you are priests and kings. Amen. Okay? You are priestesses and queens. That's royalty. Not going to get much higher than that. If you are a king under God, then what's stopping you from living a life of victory? What's stopping you from living a life of joy? Is it because you don't have a job? No. Is it because you're sick? No. 
Is it because you don't have enough money? Paul says that in all these things, we are more than conquerors. And believe me, what Paul had to deal with, we don't have to deal with. Okay? Did Paul have a job? He was a tent maker. He was a tent maker. And when he needed income, he worked as a tent maker. But when he wasn't working as a tent maker, what was he doing? He was traveling from place to place preaching the gospel of God. And sometimes he was being a tent maker while he was doing that. Why? So he didn't have to live off of other people. So he wouldn't bring shame upon the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, as a minister of God, he had every right to live off of the things of God, to have people meet his needs. But he chose not to do that. But Paul said that he was convinced that there was nothing, nothing, not death, not life, not persecutions, not sword, not nakedness, not famine, absolutely nothing that could separate him from the love of God that's found in Christ Jesus. And brothers and sisters, that is what John is telling you here in 1 John chapter 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we shall be called the children of of God. Being called children of God isn't going to happen when Jesus comes. It happens now. Right now. Max. Also, I uh, like that part in uh, Romans 8, therefore there is, or there is therefore now no condemnation in that. So it can start right now. Now, it has to start now. Listen, is this an easy life? No. No. And the older you get, doesn't it seem to get harder? <laughs> yeah. I mean, at least when you were young, at least you had youth behind you. But as you get older, you don't even have that anymore. Right? And it's not easy. But with God, the Bible says in Philippians, I can do some things. No. All things. All. No, no, not all things. I can do all. I can do all things. Through Christ, who what? Strengthens me. So listen, whether I'm facing health issues, whether I'm facing job issues, whether I'm facing money issues, whether I'm facing whatever issues, family issues, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Does that mean that tomorrow Jesus is going to heal my wife's knee? Probably not. He could. And I don't doubt that. But it's all in His will. Will God... Answer all my prayers tomorrow? He'll answer the ones that he wants to answer and the one that is in his will to answer. See, this is the difference. This is what I found in 50 years of living. I want a God that's a genie. I want to rub his lamp and I want him to come up and grant me more than three wishes. Okay? Because I have more than three. And I want God to do everything that I want him to do for me. If God was like that, he would no longer be God. I would be God. Right? Because I would control him. But God isn't a genie in the bottle. And God loves you enough to not do that for you. Listen, in your sinful nature and in your sinful state, wherever you're at, if God was to grant you every wish and God was to take away every thorn and cover every pothole to where your rest of your life was nice and smooth and everything was easy, you wouldn't need to look forward to heaven because you'd have it already. Amen. You would never want to change your fallen nature because everything would be great. Okay, so pain and suffering and hardships happen so that we look and turn to God and we realize this is not the way life is supposed to be. Death comes so we look to the God of life and realize in Him I don't have to die. The death that you die from cancer, the death that you die from getting run over by a bus, the death that you die because you lived 110 years and your heart gave out, is that what death really is? No. The Bible doesn't call that death. The Bible calls it what? Sleep. 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 There's coming a death. It's called the second death. And that's the death we want to avoid. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's the death that is eternal, everlasting. No coming back from it. Okay? When the final judgment on the wicked is given out, 
and those are slain, you're not going to be able to revive them through CPR or those heart shocker things. Okay? That death is going to be permanent. All right? God loves you so much, and He loves this world so much. Now, I want you to understand this. God loves you, and God loves Adolf Hitler in Amen. the same way. Amen. God loves you, and God loves the child molester that's sitting in jail because he killed and molested the child the same way. Amen. God loves you, and God loves Stalin, who probably in the history of his life killed more people than probably anybody else you can think of. Loves him the same way, and salvation was open, free and clear to him, just like it is for me and you. So when you leave here, and you go out, and you see that bum on the side of the road begging for food, God loves you, and God loves him the same way. Amen. When you see the alcoholic laying in the street, as he just passed out because he drank himself to oblivion, God loves him just as much as he loves you, and he sees you the same way. Paul tells you in Romans that we all have sinned, and we all fall short of the glory of God. That word fall is a I'm not an English teacher. A present participle. That's a big $10 word. <laughs> anyway, what that word means is it's continually happening. You continually fall short of the glory of God. Is that right? Amen. It's not like, well, you know, 300 years ago my ancestors fell short, but I'm good today. It means today I've fallen short of the glory of God. If God gives me breath and I wake up tomorrow, in myself I fall short of the glory of God. All right? Falling short, that's one of the definitions of sin that we looked at in our Sabbath school class. Is that right? Amen. Falling short of the mark. And that's what we do every day in this fallen human nature. Fall short. But brothers and sisters, God made a way that you don't have to fall short anymore. And that way is Jesus Christ. And that if you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, if you take Him as your King and as your Lord, you'll never fall short again. God will look at you and not see your sins or your, uh, your fallenness or all those things that you know are bad about you. What God sees is the perfection of His Son. How would you like to know that the President of the United States thought that you were the greatest American that ever lived? Okay? What would you think if Bill Gates came and thought you were the most intelligent tech person who ever walked the face of the earth. What would you think if Mother Teresa were to step in this room and pick you out and say that you are the most gracious, loving person that she ever met? Do you believe and do you know that that's how God looks at you every day through His Son, Jesus Christ? What more? What more can God do for you? How much more do we need to understand and realize how God views us? That we are His children. Now, how many of you have never disciplined your children when you were raising them? Raise your hand. <laughs> if anybody raise your hand, I want to meet your children because they're going to be brats. Okay? Is there a reason why we as parents have to discipline our children? Is there a reason why we have to teach them right from wrong? Is there a reason why those of us who are in positions of training or authority have to train the people underneath us to do what's right and not do the wrong thing? Now, if I'm working in a machine shop and I have all kind of tools there that have blades that spin at some serious RPMs, and I get a new kid in there who's about 17, never worked on all these things in his life, and it's the first thing he wants to do is take this piece of wood and put it through that machine and see how well it cuts. Am I going to let him do that? You better not. What do I have to do? I have to train, train him, right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because what's going to happen if I turn him loose on that machine? Cut his arm off. Listen, I walked into this machine shop. I was going to get a job there. This is how God works. Uh, I was 18. I needed a job, so I went to this machine shop that was in Stanford. And walking in there, I was talking to the foreman, and the foreman was missing a finger on each hand. 
And as he's walking me around, they were going to hire me to sweep the floor. And that's where I would start, and then I'd be able to be trained to work on the machines. And I'm looking at everybody that worked there, and anybody that was there for over five years was missing at least one digit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> at my age, I looked at that, and it didn't take a whole lot to figure out. They lost them here. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'd be sweeping that up. <laughs> <laughs> so, not wanting to hurt this man's feelings and say, dude, you only got like eight fingers left. I don't want to work here. <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll be in Monday. And this was uh, Thursday. Um, that Friday, I had a piece of pizza. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, my stomach hurt me so bad that I thought I was dying. So I thought I had food poisoning. It turns out I had appendicitis. Needless to say, I couldn't go to work that Monday morning. And I had a really good excuse, and it was a real one at the time. So, because all day, after I left on Thursday and Friday, I'm thinking, man, I do not want to work at this place. I want to keep all my fingers. Uh, what am I going to do? I already told this guy to show up. And so, being that age, I just wasn't going to show up. But God intervened and gave me appendicitis. Uh, you know, and that wasn't fun either. But it's one heck of an excuse to be able to get out of work. But listen, I want you to think about this. And this is where I close this morning. If you have a chance, read 1 John. Read chapter 3 and what John tells you. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Why does the world not know us? Know Why do Christians have to suffer persecution? are made fun of, are rejected, are looked at as being narrow-minded, bigoted, and crazy, because they do not know our Savior. But it is still our job to introduce them to our Savior. But you need to understand this. Whatever you face today, rejection, hurts, pains, joys, it's only temporary. That is the one thing that is guaranteed in this life. Whatever you're going through now is only temporary. If you've got a fatal disease, is it temporary? Yep. Yeah, it's temporary. It's fatal, right? It's only going to last so long and then you go down. Temporary. But there is coming a life that is going to endure and last forever. And in that life, there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more suffering. It will be a life of peace, harmony, joy, love, and the ability to see your God face to face. Have you ever thought about that? Allow your mind to comprehend what it would be like to stand in the very presence of God and not be afraid. To have God say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Day one. Day 10 billion, you get to do the same thing. To be able to be with God every day and never be separated from Him. To be with loved ones that you laid in the grave so long ago and never be separated from them again. Never have to wear glasses. Never have to have a hearing aid. Never have to worry about growing old and do I have enough insurance. Never having to worry about whether this hurricane is going to come and do damage? Will I have work tomorrow? Will I have enough food to eat? Can I get my kids through college? There will come a life that will make all the pain in this life seem like nothing. Paul says it's momentary and fleeting, the sufferings that you suffer today, compared to the glory that you'll have when Jesus comes. Let's finish reading this text. Beloved, now, what does he say? When will we be children of God? He says, Beloved, now, right now, today we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He, that is Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Now, when Jesus comes the second time, Will it be just like the first time? 
No. Will it be his humanity that will be the thing that the world sees? No. no. That's going to be his divinity. Think about that. All right? If you look at Revelation chapter 1, John sees Jesus as he is. Okay? And he is divine. God. All right? He's coming again, brothers and sisters. Are you ready for him to come? Do you want him to come? Do you hope he doesn't come today or tomorrow because mm, you're enjoying yourself too much or you're not ready? Okay? Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he will have a people to come back for. Are you those people? Do you want to be those people? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Me too. Do you realize the only thing you have to do to be those people is to accept him and believe in him and have faith that he is who he is? Amen. Closing him this morning is hymn number 530.